what we need to do now is move into the international finance aspect of our discussion. And that's to talk about finances and money. Now, when we talk about money internationally, we're talking about exchange rates. And an exchange rate is defined as how much of one currency can you get for one unit of another currency. For example, one dollar will buy you how many British pounds? All right. One dollar will buy you how many Indian rupees? Okay, so that's what we're talking about. <clears throat> Over time, the types of exchange rates we have used have changed. The first type of exchange rate we had was based on something called the gold standard. And the gold standard meant that your currency was backed by gold. Those pieces, those pieces of paper had value because there was gold in a vault someplace. <clears throat> and under the gold standard, our exchange rate was based on gold. And on the day the exchange rate was set, this is what the value of gold was. One ounce of gold equal $20.67. That was it. Now, under the fixed exchange rate, the value of the dollar could not change. It had to stay. One ounce of gold equal $20.67. Now, if there was any pressure for the value of the currency to change, if supply or demand for dollars changed and the value of the dollar was changing, <clears throat> the government couldn't allow that. The government was required to step in and maintain the value of the dollar at this rate. And it could do that by buying and selling dollars, buying and selling gold, whatever it needed to do. <clears throat> now, the problem with the fixed exchange rate was the government had to constantly intervene. Also, the government could not use monetary policy to correct the economy. Now, <clears throat> In the early part of this period, um, from about 1815 to 1915, in that range, remember, we had a laissez-faire economy. Government didn't intervene. It wasn't government intervention. We didn't see until around the 1930s when Roosevelt um, came into power in 1933. Um, the fixed exchange rate does not end in 1933 because of Roosevelt or anything like that. The fixed exchange rate ended in 1933 because it was the middle of the Great Depression. The government couldn't afford to spend money to maintain an exchange rate for a currency that wasn't being used for trade. Trade virtually ceased during the Great Depression. And so government said, we're not even going to pretend this anymore. We're going to stop maintaining this exchange rate. Um, so the U.S. goes off the fixed exchange rate system in 1933, although it does not really replace it with anything. The U.S. exchange rate maintains this value, one ounce of gold equal $20.67, although the government does not maintain the rate. Okay, it's kind of an artificial exchange rate. But most of the other countries in the world did the same thing. So the exchange rate really was not reflecting the true value of the currency. We would go for more than a decade with this artificial exchange rate. The fixed exchange rate that didn't really reflect the value of the currency. It wasn't until 1944 when it became apparent that the Allies were months away from winning the war that the trade ministers, the finance ministers from the Allied nations and some neutral nations decided to get together to create an or a series of organizations to make sure that the world economy that comes out of the Second World War is a stable one. Remember, prior to the Second World War, we had the Great Depression. 
And so the international economy was totally messed up, not only from the Great Depression, but also from the war. <clears throat> and so in 1944, in a small little ski village in New Hampshire called Bretton Woods, an international monetary conference or an international conference was held that established three building blocks upon which the world economy was to be built. The first was known as GATT, G-A-T-T, and that stands for the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Now, initially, this was an agreement. It was a treaty. And the countries that signed this treaty agreed to come together in a series of trade negotiations in an attempt to remove trade barriers. And these trade negotiations still go on. There's still a movement to try to remove trade barriers. Um, and in 1995, this GATT, this agreement, morphed into what is now known as the World Trade Organization. It is a formal organization that holds these trade negotiations. The second building block upon which the New World Economic Order was to be built was something called the World Bank. It's actually, its official name is the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And its official name really tells you what it was organized to do. Initially, it was set up, if you joined the World Bank, you paid dues. Your dues went into this big pot of money. And then that money was used to make loans for countries so that they could reconstruct after the war. Now, by the 1960s, uh, most of the nations, at least the European nations who had suffered most of the damage, had reconstructed. So the World Bank was now looking for a new goal for it to uh, try to work towards. And it moved to the second part of its name, which was development. Today, the World Bank makes most of its loans to developing nations to help them develop their economies. There are things, there are projects like, do you want to um, build roads to all of the corners of your, of your country? That may be an expense that a developing government can't afford. So it could borrow money from the World Bank to do that. They build, they give loans for all sorts of infrastructure, building roads, you know, bringing in electricity, hydroelectric dams, all sorts of things. Um, so the World Bank is still uh, very active. Um, and if you go down um, to Washington, D.C., uh, you can visit the World Bank headquarters. The final building block upon which the um, New World Economic Order that came out of the Bretton Woods Conference was the International Monetary Fund. Now, the International Monetary Fund, while it looks like it stopped in 1971, I'll talk about that in a second, um, the International Monetary Fund is still around, and its goal is to help nations determine and maintain stable exchange rates. Now, at the Brent Woods Conference, John Maynard Keynes came and said, I have a great idea for a new exchange rate system. People thought he was nuts. They ignored him. The exchange rate system they came up with is what we call the pegged exchange rate. And the pegged exchange rate went into effect in 1946. And the way the pegged exchange rate system works was that the value of the dollar was set to a value of gold, similar to what happened under the fixed system. The difference between the two is now, although the value of the dollar is fixed to a value of gold, under the peg system, the value of the dollar could go up 2.5% to $35.88, or it could go down 2.5% to 34.13. 
as long as the value of the dollar stayed within this range, the government did not need to step in. Now, this was a little better than the fixed rate, because remember, under the fixed rate, if it moved even half a penny, the government had to step in. This was great for the government because it gave them a little breathing room. As long as the value of the dollar didn't go outside of this range, everything was fine. If the value of the dollar tried to go higher or lower, then the government had to step in the way it did before. Now. The other difference between the fixed rate and the pegged rate is that under the pegged exchange rate, the rest of the world linked the value of their currency to the US dollar. For example, the peg for the British pound was one British pound equal $20.80. Probably the value on the day they were set. So we had a very different exchange rate system. In 1971, the U.S. found itself with a very unstable both social and political system and found that we could no longer maintain even the pegged exchange rate. So in 1971, President Nixon gets on TV and says, we are removing ourselves from the pegged exchange rate and remoting moving to the floating or flexible exchange rate. Under the floating exchange rate, the value of the dollar is determined by supply and demand for the dollar. Basically, it's set in a, the way the price of anything else is by the market. Now, this leads to some rather colorful <coughs> uh, definitions. We could practice a clean float. A clean float is one in which the government does not intervene in the economy, in the exchange rate at all, just lets the market determine it. Or we could practice what most nations practice is a dirty float. A dirty float is a time when the government may choose to step in and buy and sell currency, buy and sell gold in order to change the value of their currency. Now, why would a government do that? It would do it if the value of the dollar got strong. A strong dollar means one dollar now purchases more foreign currency. The good thing about that is if as the dollar gets stronger, foreign goods appear cheaper, all right, because it takes less dollars to buy what you need. Unfortunately, looking from the other perspective, is that exports, U.S. goods being purchased overseas, appear more expensive because as the dollar buys more British pounds, the British pound buys less dollars. So U.S. goods in England appear much more expensive. Or the government could choose to weaken the, if we had a weak dollar, a weak dollar means the U.S. dollar buys less of a foreign currency. So instead of one dollar buying two British pounds, one dollar may now buy one British pound. That's a weak dollar. Well, that's great if you're an exporter, because from the British perspective, U.S. goods appear cheaper, takes fewer fewer British pounds to buy a dollar. But that discourages imports. Now, what exchange rate system is best? Depends on how you look at it. There are quite a number of people who have talked about us returning to the gold standard because they felt the value of the dollar was much more stable. What do you think? Believe it or not, that's our last lecture for this semester. I hope you enjoyed them, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.